Greetings and welcome again to another installation of the African-American Preaching Legacy Series. I am Dr. Courtney Buggs, the director of the African-American Preaching and Sacred Rhetoric PhD program here at Christian Theological Seminary. I have partnered with Dr. Frank Thomas, the visionary for this legacy series so that we might continue to record the legacy of African-American preaching and preachers and teachers of preaching. I am so excited today to welcome our guest, a seminary dean from Louisville Presbyterian Seminary, and also the Frank Caldwell Professor of Homiletics, Dr. Deborah Mumford. Welcome to CTS. Thank you. Welcome back again, and welcome to the preaching series. Thank you, I'm honored to be here. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us. So we know a little bit just about what I've named about your bio, but what I'd like you to do is just tell us a little bit about you, kind of introduce yourself. Sure, so, um, so I am from Eastern North Carolina, so grew up there. My father is, uh, is still a missionary Baptist preacher and uh, so grew up in the church, had to go to church, oh, it seemed like almost every day, uh, but all the time. And so one of the things, so having to go to church that much growing up, when I went to college, one of the things I, I wanted to do least was still go to church. <laughs> and so I took a hiatus while I was at Howard, um, uh, doing my under, undergraduate degree. Um, but still after that, church was still, embedded, it was still there. And so after I graduated, I lived in Parkersburg, West Virginia. I worked for Corning Incorporated. My, my, um, uh, my bachelor's was in mechanical engineering, actually. So I worked with Corning Incorporated, but while I was in Parkersburg, um, I, had, I had to find a church. And uh, so there were two black churches in Parkersburg, West Virginia. One was AME and another one was Baptist. And so the, and the first place I went was Baptist. That's my background. That was the most boring church I ever <laughs> been to. And I was like, okay, let's head over to the AMEs. And I found a home. And, uh, and even then I began to have a sense of call to ministry. So I was working with the youth there. And uh, if they ever gave me a chance to, to speak in, in the service, I would do that. So even then I had a sense of call but um, I just, you know, continued to do engineering for a little while. But after about three years of being there, I applied for a job, went out to the West Coast to work with Clorox. And when I got there, I was like, you know, this whole call thing, I think I need to actually lean into it. And so I... Um, found a church in Berkeley, California. And the name of the church was Church by the Side of the Road. And the pastor of the church happened to be also a systematic theologian and a professor at the American Baptist Seminary of the West. And they had an opening for youth ministry. But he said, all right, now, if you really want to be a full-time youth minister, what you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to go to seminary. And it's like, all right, uh, uh, let's do it. And uh, so he's like, no, you, you need to actually get in your car, follow me today because the fall session is gonna start. And this was some like, must've been like June. And so you need to f fill out the application today and they'll get back to you, see if you can start in the fall. I filled out an application and uh, two weeks later I was got my acceptance letter and I was starting seminary. And uh, that was pretty amazing. <laughs> and uh, so it was kind of this thing um, because I had some classmates that I'd gone to Howard with, you know, in engineering. And they were like, you're leaving engineering to do what? And now you want to be a youth pastor? And um, it, was, it was a major shift. And especially financially, I mean, it was a big financial hit. But one of the things I found is that as I leaned into it more, um, you know, I had to downsize, got a little apartment in Oakland that <laughs> I could afford. But I actually used the money that I did make in, as a youth minister even more uh, efficiently, you know? I had less, but I used it well. And so I was able to make my way through the MDiv program, no debt, um, then 
that was not enough. It's like, oh, okay, I got the bug now. I got to, I got to keep going. And uh, so I did an MA in biblical languages, and it's like, okay, that's that's still not quite enough. And um, having seen that pastor who who had a PhD and he was a pastor, and uh, I was like, he can do that. I, I can do that too. So I had to figure out at that point. Um, so what do I want to get a PhD in? And so uh, having done a master's in biblical languages, it's like, okay, so naturally, like, like, you know, maybe lean into Bible, but they didn't go far enough with Bible. So with Bible, you're exploring, you know, all of the languages you're you're looking at, um, you know, some of the nuances, the phonetics, uh, some of the possibilities for interpretation, which I like, which is good but they didn't go far enough to applying it to people's lives, right? And so when I had just, just took time to kind of think about where is it that I think I could find joy and really, really, really um, um, just like what I do every day, it was teaching, preaching, because that's where all of the disciplines meet up. You know, to be a good preacher, you have to you have to do really solid biblical interpretation, exegesis, of course. But then you're bringing into it all of the other disciplines as well. There's some church history there, some uh, sociology. There's all of these disciplines converge in preaching. And so when I was thinking about what to study, yes, like homiletics, that's it. Now, I had some people saying, you know, isn't it kind of cliche? for a black person to be teaching, preaching? Maybe, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's like, it, it, if that's where I have my energy, mm-hmm. then that's what I, sh- I should be doing. And, um, and I haven't regretted that decision at all. And um, so, you know, having now taught preaching uh, full-time since 2007, mm. um, I don't regret that. I think it was a a good decision and I really love the classroom. I love uh, helping students, some of whom are petrified the first day. It's like, just, you know, relax. And um, it's not about you. And if we can establish that from the first day, um, then we can make some headway in, into this whole thing. So, um, so it's been an interesting journey. Well, I'm going to just continue there since you're talking about the classroom. Let's let's talk a little bit sure, more about sure, that. Sure. In the sometimes we have this mix of very experienced students. Sometimes we have the less experienced students, even down to the no experienced <laughs> students. <laughs> exactly, it's very mixed. Yeah. So I wonder if you can talk about some of your own practices and techniques of teaching, preaching. Right, yeah. So, so one of the things that I discovered when I started teaching at Louisville uh, was that uh, quite a few of our students, um, um, the majority of, of the, were white, reformed, you know, Presbyterian students, and we have incre- increased in, in African-American populations, but, but many uh, c- come in from traditions where they haven't been taught to use their bodies in preaching at all. It's as if uh, they believe that the best way to preach is uh, somehow without any affect, mm-hmm. uh, without any uh, enthusiasm, because that may somehow taint uh, the sermon. It's like, oh, c- come on now. So we, we need to, because the best sermons are a combination of good content and excellent delivery. Mm-hmm. And in order to deliver it, you have to bring your whole self to this process. They were really good about putting the head in, right? So I didn't have to stretch them as far as doing solid exegesis. What I did have to stretch them in is how to pull that off of the page and to embody it in a way that made it engaging and not a lecture. And so it's like, okay, nobody wants to show up on Sunday morning to hear a lecture. Are you hitting the heart? So, you know, so at the time, you know, I had to pull out some Mitchell, of course, some Thomas, you know, it's like, okay, what about it tapping into people's lived experiences 
And in order to do that, how about, you know, tell them a little bit about your own experience. You're not the center of it, but you use your own life kind of as an example. So one of the things I started doing to loosen some of the students up at the beginning is to have them just tell a story. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe two, three weeks in, we do, do, I do a little workshop on, you know, how to tell story effectively. And then their first assignment is to tell their story. So not a, a, a story from, you know, uh, even from the Bible, just your story, no paper, just tell it. Give me five minutes and tell something. And you should need paper to tell your own story. Mm. So, uh, so using uh, some, you know, good structure, um, then they, they tell their own story. And so when they do that, by the time they get up to preach, then it's like they're a little bit looser because they've used their bodies. It's like, move around in the space, it's okay. Um, and uh, make the space yours. Um, and uh, so that has improved their preaching in, in some ways. And, I, and so I, that's something I'll keep in there, you know, as far as the, the preaching classroom is concerned. So one of the critiques um, often that's associated with black preaching uh -oh. is, <laughs> I could list many, but I'll start with one, <laughs> is this sense of um, emotion and the expressiveness of much of black preaching. So I wonder if that critique shows up in your classroom and, and how, do you, how do you address that? Yeah, so it's okay, and, and I think I, I, it, it showed up early on, I think when I first started preaching. And, and so one of the things that I had to tell students is that um, we looked at different videos of people, you know, preaching. And just to compare, it's like, so would you rather go to church, you get dressed up, you, you know, you eat, you, you dress up, you take the kids, you, you pile everybody up in the car, right? And so you guys go and you sit in the space, would you rather hear this preacher or this preacher? And so, and you have someone who's there and very wooden, and there's no affect, don't know if they actually believe what they're even saying, or would you rather have someone who has done the work and they're solid exegesis, but they're delivering in a way that brings you into it. You see yourself in it. Um, they hit your heart, but then also are engaging. And so what is the problem, you know, with that? Because I think if we think that preaching is solely an academic exercise, then that is problematic because then we're not, and I think it's bad theologically, we, we serve a holistic God who gives us bodies as well as minds. And I don't think we should separate the two in somehow having an ode to the uh, supremacy of academics over the mind. That's a problem. We are whole beings. And so it just makes sense that whatever we do uh, wh whether it's in the classroom, in the pulpit, we should bring our whole selves into that whole process. So, and if we don't, I think that that is not uh, <laughs> a theologically sound proposition. And it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, and that too. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about how um, we talk in the homiletical classroom about voice and, and preachers uh, establishing one's preaching voice. And one of the things that I hear talked about today, or even I've experienced in my classroom, is sometimes I can hear someone preach and I immediately know who they're listening to. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted you to talk a little bit about the importance of establishing one's own oh. preaching voice and whatever that might look like for Absolutely. you. Absolutely, because I think it, we do learn mm -hmm. from hearing other people, seeing how they uh, uh, engage in preaching, learn so much about you know, what they do with their bodies, what they do with the biblical text. Yeah. We, 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 we learn a lot, but all of us bring to our lived experiences um, a particular worldview. Yeah. And so when somebody, and I try to teach students that when somebody invites you to preach, 
They invite you into their church to preach. They want you to bring you, not to be like somebody else you saw on television. Something about your perspective, about the way you look at the biblical text, the way you tell a story, the way you bring it all together, that's what they want you to bring to the classroom. And I give some um, examples. Like there was one time I was invited to, uh, t to preach in a uh, Korean congregation in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I had a classmate in a seminary and he's like, so he heard me preaching in, in, in preaching class and he says, come to my church and, and preach, preach in my church. And, um, but then he also said that you're going to be translated. So, so you're going to say something and they're going to, you know, translate it into Korean. So you have to stop. And then it's like, oh my God. And so I was so uptight mm -hmm. with that whole process that I did not bring who I was. He did not see the person that he saw in the classroom in his church and it fell so flat. And he, afterwards he said, so what happened? Why didn't you bring your whole self, that same person that I saw in the classroom. And it was, I was just overthinking that whole thing. And so when we bring our whole selves to the process, our, our experiences and just speak the way we do it, um, then people, whatever their culture, whatever their experience, they resonate with that. Be, because you can resonate with someone who's uh, in, in their authenticity. And when they're being inauthentic, parroting some, somebody else, you can feel that too. Yeah. And uh, so even uh, those uh, in, in the classroom with, uh, who they're not perfect, you know, they, they, they may not have the, the best flow in their sermon, but they engage uh, a congregation in a much more effective way because people can feel it, right? It's like, oh yes, I can, I can resonate with their experience and, uh, and it may hit you in a, in a very different way. So always, always be authentic and continue to work on the, on the craft. Sure. Yeah. So one of the things that, that, you're, that comes up in our classrooms also is this idea of assessment. Oh. And <laughs> how do we, how do we assess sermons? What language do we use? <laughs> and some people talk about it as like, oh my goodness. So it's like, so it's like, are you grading the Holy Spirit? Right. And it's like, well, no, but there are some, there are some, um, there are some ways to, to look at how effective a sermon is. And some, if you um, dissect it by some of the elements, you know uh, when some of those elements work well and some of them don't. Let's start with an introduction, for instance, right? So it's like, how do you start the sermon? How do you get people on the hook? Um, do you talk about something that happened this week that happens to also uh, resonate with your theme and that brings them in and lets them know that not only is the sermon gonna be engaging, but it's also gonna be relevant. So you get them on the hook. So you can assess an introduction. Did it work well? Um, did it um, somehow resonate with the lives of the people in the pew? And you can give some feedback on that. And if it didn't work well, you can give feedback <laughs> on that too. Um, so how does it flow from one part of the sermon to the next? Are the transitions smooth? Or are people left wondering like, you started here, you got me here, and I have no idea how you made it from point A to point Z and uh, there was no clear path. You can assess that. Um, ex exegesis, so is there some content uh, that you've done in some of your exegesis, but you put it in the sermon in a way it doesn't feel like it's a, a, a lecture, but it's more informative, it's, 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 it's providing the sermon a solid foundation, and you do that well, and it's just enough, not too much. Mm -hmm. You can assess that, right? Um, and do some of the stories that you tell in, in the sermon, do they apply to the lives of the people in the pew? I've been in, and I, I remember being at a seminary in the Bay Area and had um, someone telling a story about um, his experience over the summer. Uh, so this was a seminary president. He 
came back and he was telling, um, uh, preaching in chapel and talking about how he spent his summer on Cape Cod reading books. And we were like, we all here working, <laughs> you know, while you on the, on the Cape, uh, we're working really hard. That was not a good example to use for us because we were resenting it, first of all. It's like you were getting paid for reading? Uh, anyway, not a good example. <laughs> And uh, so whatever examples that we use, we should make sure that the people in the pew resonate with it. They, they feel that we understand their experience. And if we can relate that, then it works. It's a good application. We can assess that, right? So uh, closing, how do, we, how do we do it? Do we challenge people to do something different, to live different, to believe something different, to go out and do something? We can also assess that. So, and then also, what do we do with our bodies? If, we're, if we have some kind of just distracting movements, like we're, we're flying airplanes, you know, throughout this whole thing, oh, we can assess that, right? <laughs> right? Is there eye contact? Um, are you looking up at the ceiling and the people are right there? We can, we can give you some feedback on that. So elements of the sermon, while people say, you know, assessment, you know, how can you, how can you assess a sermon? Oh, it's, it, it's quite possible. And, and it's all, all whether it's effective for the people to whom, with whom you're preaching. Well, let's talk a little about, you started to talk about this a little about method and structuring sermons and the preparation process of sermons. So can you talk us through your <laughs> method? <laughs> Um, or methods, for that matter. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to suggest there has to be one. Yeah, so as so a so teaching um, students to preach, I had to figure out, yeah, after going through a PhD program, reading all the books, had this reading list, it's like, so how am I going to do this? And uh, the first class I taught at Louisville Seminary, I, I, out of PhD school, so, you know, I had read all the books. Yes. Oh, I'm ready. ready, you know. So, so I get there, and I'm um, you know, taking them through some of these these methods, and uh, and uh, so I had I had made my way through it at least about half an hour in, into the class, and it's like I'm 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 going through this thing, and uh, had this African American woman in the back of the classroom raise her hand, and said, uh, "Professor Mumford," I said, "Yes. Does the Holy Spirit have any place mm. in preaching?" Mm. Oh, man, um, of course. <laughs> so with all of my preparation for teaching students how to do this, somehow, I, even though I had read Forbes at the time, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, that was one book on the Holy Spirit, right? So somehow in all of my preparation, I had not talked about the place of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in preaching. Mm -hmm. So from that day forward, the first thing I do, uh, when we teach the students uh, t about preaching is to begin with inviting the Holy Spirit into this process. Okay. So before you even uh, choose your biblical text, because you need the help of the Holy Spirit to, to choose the text that, that will apply to particular people in a particular place at a particular time. Mm. So before you do any of that, invite the Holy Spirit into this process. Uh, and when that happens, then uh, there is a, a much better chance of this sermon really being something that people will take with them when they go. All right. So, so part of that, so that's part of the process, but then um, you talked about voice uh, and, and people finding their voice at some point. So for me, it's, it's, it's really important that people, even in the exegetical process, begin to use their own voice in preaching. And part of it is inviting them as they choose a biblical text, however they do it, whether they, you know, if they free will Baptist, they can just open up the Bible and choose anything, or they, um, they um, you know, have uh, some other lectionary methods or something. Uh, however they get to it, then when they are reading the text, just ask of that text every single question they can think of, you know, and write those questions down. When they do that, what they find is that my questions from...
based on my experience of life, are going to be very different than somebody else's questions. Mm -hmm. And so then go back and pursue those questions and research those questions, find answers. And, and even in that process, there's a perspective that's coming through that is uniquely theirs. Right. So so that's part of the process. And then, of course, give them um, some different approaches for uh, for uh, af after they uh, kind of come up with a, a theme. So, you know, we've looked at different books, uh, Tom Long, we've looked at Jennifer Brooks. We uh, look at um, different places, but they come and they have this theme, a very succinct theme for the sermon. Uh, look at different structures, you know, for the sermon, some possibilities of how, how to pull that together. Uh, but then also encourage them, it's like, okay, so now if you have a, a draft of this sermon, um, then uh, now you need to somehow um, internalize this uh, in some way. Uh, so I do encourage uh, students to uh, practice a sermon. Now, again, that comes back to like, you know, what about the practice? Holy Spirit, right? So why should I practice yeah. a sermon? Because then um, uh, am I not then uh, not relying on the, the, the moment mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit and, and this like, well, OK. So now if you were uh, in a choir, uh, you guys rehearse. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and why do you rehearse? You rehearse because, you know, all the parts need to come together in a way that produce uh, a musical melody. So oh, there's a blend. So and, and that happens when you have all everybody knows the notes, everybody uh, works together. So you as the preacher, uh, some rehearsal, there's some internal um, I guess internally by internalizing this message, uh, what that means is that it is in your mind and in your heart in a way that it would not be ordinarily. And to me, some people say, well, then uh, what about the Holy Spirit in the moment? Uh, I'm more open to the Holy Spirit if I have internalized this message because I have a foundation. Yeah. And I can pivot if I need to. If I'm looking out and I see and I feel something that needs to be said that I, is not in there, I am more likely to do it if I prepare than if I have not. Mm -hmm. Right. And plus, I have more. I just feel more confident mm -hmm. as a preacher. I'm always nervous no matter what, that, that has not gone away. Mm -hmm. um, but I, am, I feel more confident in that I've done all that I can do as a preacher. And I do believe that God requires that I just not stand up and rely on the Holy Spirit week after week, that I should do some work mm -hmm. to try to make sure I have a word for the people. And if I incline my ear, mm -hmm. God always gives a word. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, so if I do that, then then I'm ready and and the Holy Spirit can still have its way in the moment. Amen. Yeah. Amen. yeah. So I want to ask you to explain just a little bit. Some of our viewers are seminary trained. Others are not. And so I want to um, pick at a couple of the terms. So can you say a little bit more about exegesis? When exegesis. You say that? Oh, what sure. So what on earth are you talking and about? When you say structures, maybe you can give us a mini one, two minute. <laughs> here's an example. Of. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so when we talk about exegesis, what we mean is um, actually studying the biblical text and doing research in the biblical text. So basically. And so there are a lot of tools for exegesis uh, as far as uh, concordances and Bible dictionaries that help us. If, like if you're, if you're looking at a, a, a particular passage and there are some terms that are in it, you might not kind of understand. There may be some practices that are happening that you don't understand. For instance, uh, you know, so why were women so denigrated and in many biblical passages? So going back and look at some of the 
uh, some of the writings of biblical scholars who talk about the, the practices and the patriarchy of um, in, in, in biblical times, then you understand that women, women were property uh, and all of, all of those things. So by doing a, a kind of a, exegesis is kind of a deeper dive into uh, understanding the Bible and the customs and the terms. And if you, uh, as a preacher, dig into those and are able to include some of that in your sermons, then you help your people walk away, not with just a surface understanding of the Bible, but with a much deeper understanding of what was really happening in the biblical world. So, with, <clears throat> so that then you're better able to make that, uh, that bridge, the hermeneutical bridge from the biblical world to our time. So that's exegesis kind of in a nutshell. Um, and then the other term is structures. structures. So, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if we talk about structures, then that is, so how do, once I have an idea of what my theme is, so how do I put it together in a way that makes sense that people can actually follow? Uh, and to, so there are a lot of, you know, kind of structures that are out there, like four pages of a sermon with Paul Scott Wilson. There's, uh, uh, there's the, uh, the Wesley quadrilateral. <laughs> so, um, and so just like kind of set structures so that uh, if you're kind of, kind of figuring out uh, how you want to lay out your sermon, then you can try putting it into some of these structures, see if it works uh, without spending a whole lot of time on creating new ways of kind of putting it together. So, so it can be helpful to have some, some structures in place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I like that a lot of times what, what uh, students, preachers want to do is everything has to be brand new. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to reinvent everything. Um, so there's a lot of people who've been preaching forever. Uh, and so through videos, through uh, biblical, I mean, some, some, some preaching textbooks, uh, there, there are a lot, a lot of paths that have already been blazed uh, for you if you just kind of kind of you know, are willing to read and just spend some time learning from people who've been doing it for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm with you, we deal with the spirit and scholarship. What? So I'd like you to say a couple of words about if you were to recommend one or two books that you might think would be useful to, to those who are um, trying to work on their preaching. I know there's a ton, so I'm putting you on the spot to, limit your bibliography. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, so, so one of the things, of course, I have to go to uh, Lisa's Thompson, Lisa Thompson's Ingenuity, okay. uh, Preaching as an Outsider. I like that book because she challenges, um, so even though people like to say, isn't this a, a book for and by black women? Uh-huh, mm -hmm. it is. And just like uh, so many of us have learned for years, it's from textbooks written by white men. Uh, people can learn a lot from textbooks written by uh, African-American women. And so in, in her book, she, she, she talks about the need for people to, who have been outside of the tre preaching tradition uh, to be to find a way to be their authentic selves while also fitting into the tradition, but not fitting in such a way that they lose who they are. And so um, for some people who may be outside of various traditions, this is a really good uh, way of thinking about pre preaching and finding your place in it. And even if you're solid, solid, solidly within the tradition, uh, there's some things you can learn too. So I, so I like, I like her book. I like, uh, of course, and can always go back to um, you know, some uh, Frank Thomas, of course, mm -hmm. um, you know, preaching a celebration because it's really important um, and it, because one of the things that he, he talks about is that um, there's a need to bring the sermon to a close in a way 
that reinforces what has been said, but then there's also some celebration with that. And it's not necessarily always hooping, but you can do it in, in, in quite a few ways. So I think that, um, that's a book I think that's, that's really important. Uh, and even this is an old book, it's a classic for me. Uh, Christine Smith, uh, Preaching as Weeping, Preaching is Confession weeping. Yes. and the Resistance. Yes. Um, and that book for me was just, just seminal in so many ways because one of the things that she says up front is that preaching is a theological act. And I was like, oh, yes it is. Uh, which means that a preacher needs to continually examine her theology, what she's saying about God, uh, how God is working in the world, and then resistance to the uh, principalities and powers in the world is something that we all need to do. And she just uses, you know, some of the, uh, some of the, I guess, challenges that, uh, and this book is what, 25, 30 years old, that are still with us. So, so many sexism, homophobia, uh, racism, all those things, they're still with us. And the need for uh, prophetic preachers to preach about resisting those, those powers that, that seek to oppress and marginalize. Um, so that, of course, um, and then what else? Um, if you're kind of thinking about, uh, I like, I like J Jennifer Brooks, that she did a preaching text that we can actually use as a preaching text in our, in our classroom and reminding us of good news. Preaching is good news. And um, so one of the things, and I found myself sometimes in, in preaching, preaching a sermon, and I'm, on my soapbox, what we're not doing as, as good Christians. But then at, at the end of the sermon, I have not given people good news, right? So it's like, is there any good news? Or are you just gonna, you just wanna, you know, just take people to task? It's like, no, even in, in those situations where, where we're challenging each other uh, to be better, uh, uh, to do better, there should always be good news that we don't have to stay where we are because we serve a risen savior. We, uh, and, and through the power of Jesus Christ, we can be better. And uh, so it's like, that's always at, the, at the, the least of the good news we can provide um, people. So those are a few. Sure, yeah, sure, off sure. The, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. So as you think about your own preaching life, what is one of the most difficult preaching experiences you may have had hmm. through the years? So one of them, I think, was preaching a few days after 9-11 in 2001. Mm -hmm. So I was, in a, I was gonna preach in the chapel at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley. Uh, I was actually on staff there as, a, uh, as an admissions director at the time and um, I hadn't yet decided to go back to PhD school, but it was coming. Mm -hmm. um, but I was supposed to preach in chapel and then 9-11 happened. I had this whole sermon sermon I had been working on for, for weeks and I was like, I was ready, right? And, and then in that moment, of course, I could not preach that. I had to th just throw that out. Talk, maybe I'll, I'll preach that a different day, but then and at the time, there was so much, because this had just happened, everybody was trying to find the reason they were blaming, uh, uh, you know, everybody who's Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, and so some of the, the witch hunts were happening in Muslim populations. Um, and the depictions that were being cast on television were the innocent hands of the Americans and the uh, very guilty hands of the Muslims who came and they toppled, you know, um, you know, ran their planes into the Pentagon and, and then also in, in, in the buildings in New York. And it's like, okay, so I have to preach a sermon that one, uh, addresses the fact that yeah, three thousand lives were lost. So, so we have to have to say that, and it's a tragedy. And, but we cannot then begin as a nation 
to do witch hunts mm -hmm. on people who uh, d d may may worship differently. And so it was the difficulty kind of walk, walking the line, right? So there was a lot of grief happening in the country, but then at the same time, nobody's innocent in this, whole, in, in this whole process. And if you really want to think about our history and, and some of those nations, there are a lot of people probably have a lot of reasons to be mad at anybody who's American. So it's, it was just trying to walk this fine line. That was a very difficult sermon to preach, but it was one that I think I wanted to preach because I wanted people to see the complexity of the whole situation and not scapegoat people who look different than they did. Or, so it's that kind of thing. And so even um, in, our, in our world, sometimes as, as a preacher, we have to walk kind of the fine line um, to validate, to affirm uh, people who have loss, but then at the same time, challenge ourselves to be different to be better and uh, to examine some of the ways we may have been complicit in some of the situ situations that, that we've created that could have been uh, causal for some of those other things. So anyway, it's not always easy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even as we think about preaching today. Yes. Yes. And the complexities. And the complexities. Yeah. Like, um, you know, even last week uh, with the uh, well, mass shootings happen every day in yes. our nation, but there were, you know, five people were shot and killed in, in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And and so it is, so one, you have someone who has mental health challenges. And um, so that is a reality. But then you also have a, a society where uh, the, that does not have adequate gun laws to control who gets in, who gets a weapon and who doesn't, mm -hmm. because he bought that a few weeks before, even though he had mental health challenges. Um, so what things do we put in place um, so that people don't have access to guns to carry out um, those? types of mass shootings um, over and over again. And so, you know, we have to preach both. Yes, mental health care is, is necessary and needed. But then there's also, if he were not a white male, would mental health care be the first place they go if he were a black male carrying out the same mass shooting? Uh, would he be characterized very differently? So complexities. Right. So the reality of racism, all of that sexism comes into our preaching moment as well. It's just not simple. But uh, but those are the kinds of things that I think we should address and just be ready to get any kind of <laughs> feedback we might get. But I think it's important for us to raise those issues so that we as a society, um, the prophetic preacher, preacher continually pushes us to be better, to live into who we say we are uh, as the people of God. And if we really think that all people are people of God, are created in the image of God, then we will affirm all of humanity in our preaching in some ways. So I think that's important. So to those who say, ah, oh, yeah, but all that social stuff doesn't belong in the pulpit. All that political stuff, however you want to define political, well, doesn't belong ago. in the pulpit. Yeah, well, a few weeks ago, Kelly Brown Douglas um, was, was on our campus and she was the Grawmeyer uh, Award winner in religion uh, for her book, Resurrection Hope. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the, when somebody um, uh, asked that question uh, and said, you know, politics, so what place does politics have in the preacher? And she says, well, that, that, this is the best answer I saw. She said, the cross is the center of our belief, the center of all we do. And so you, if you have someone who was crucified on a cross and as a political act, as the center of our faith, there is no separation 
between faith and politics. It's at the center of all we do. The cross is a symbol of the uh, conflagration of politics and faith. And it's, and it's, it's so stark, we should not miss it. And I was like, that's a good answer. I like that one. And um, so I, I, there should be no separation between politics and faith. And again, it, it's because we serve a whole God, uh, a God of mind and body and spirit. So God is just not concerned about my spirit and making sure that I, I have a, a good spiritual relationship with God. Uh, that is not the concern. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So there's some acting, there's a way of being um, that is uh, imperative to my faith. And that means I have to treat uh, people I encounter the same way I want to be treated. Uh, and that does not just make sure that I, I give them water when they're thirsty, but also make sure that the water that they drink is not polluted. You know, so, so is there a limit on, you know, what I should do as a neighbor? I don't think so. And so the systems and structures that keep some people from being who God created them to be, I believe that I have some responsibility uh, if I have uh, some influence and, and ability to make someone's life better just by raising my voice or doing something, why shouldn't I do that? It seems like I have a Christian responsibility. Christ would want me to do that, you know? So separation, there is no separation. Mm -hmm. So if you were to offer some words of encouragement to preachers today, whether they be preachers in their early preaching career or- Baby preachers. Yeah, <laughs> or not. So what, what are some words that you might offer? Mm, I would say that um, it is really important for preachers to be well-rounded in their knowledge of the academics, you know, as far as, um, you know, scholarship, what are the latest books, you know, in preaching, um, to, to watch other people do this, do this thing, because preaching is praxis, so it's not just something I read about, but it's something that I do and I engage in, so uh, I'm engaging in as much praxis as possible but also being um, keen observers of the world. I think going back to that Christine Smith book, she says, um, you know, it, a, a good preacher is also a good sociologist, one who is able to look at the world around him, her, them, and see what is happening in the world. Uh, and as they think about the world theologically, uh, and are prayerful and let, allow the Holy Spirit to lead, then they are able to s see what God may be doing in the world. And so it's always important for preaching to be relevant. So that means that you have to know the context in which you preach. So who are the people? What are they going through in their lives? And uh, you should never, ever, as a preacher, be able to preach the same sermon in one church that you preach in another church. Mm. So, uh, for, and why? Because the people, even if it's down the street, they're different people. Uh, what's happening in their lives is not the same thing as, as what's happening uh, in, in the lives of other people. So it's important that, that preachers be not only um, exegetes of the biblical text, but also of the lives of the people in the congregation. The more they know about them, the more effective can that sermon be. Yeah, yeah. so I think that would be um, some of the advice. And, uh, and to just continually be surprised by what God will do through them if they're open to it. Yeah. Places they may uh, go, opportunities they may have, and don't limit it because their imaginations may be limited. Yeah. You know, it's like, you don't know where God's gonna take you, just just be open and just, just go. Mm -hmm. And so that would, I give them that advice too. So as we think about your own preaching, can you talk about 
perhaps people, they may be preachers, maybe not, who have influenced <laughs> your own preaching journey? Um, so I have to start with my father as a preacher. So, uh, so growing up in um, Baptist Church in East North Carolina, he a, every week he, he would preach an expository sermon. So, uh, you know, so he would, you know, choose a passage, of course, and walk people through you know, the, the text and then, and then cite exa examples to kind of help uh, uh, apply it to their lives. And so that, that is something. So even though I've learned um, so many approaches to preaching over the years and all of that, at the baseline, my preaching is expository. Okay. <laughs> and, and so, uh, so that's been a, a, a major influence. Yeah. Um, and, and I remember, uh, while I was in seminary in Berkeley at the church by the side of the road, the pastor used to bring in Renita Weems mm -hmm. uh, to preach revivals uh, periodically. And I remember hearing her preach for the first time, the way she dug into the biblical text and she just, it seemed like she just milked that text for all it was worth. So there was just nothing. It's like, there's nothing left. It's like, okay. But I left all of those sermons, but she still did it in a way that was engaging and that was relevant. But I left wanting to go back and read that biblical text mm -hmm. and then do my own kind of scholarship around it because she had just done it so well. And so, I, as, a, as a preacher, I always wanted to have to create sermons where it, it wasn't a surface understanding of the Bible. It was it was I, I took the time and tried to dig into it as much as possible so that I could understand it better and hopefully bring that understanding um, to other people. Uh, and so that was important. Also, at that same church, I think when I was first thinking about, you know, answering the call to ministry. The pastor was male, but then he had an assistant pastor that was an African-American female. Mm. And the first time I saw her in that pulpit, just doing her thing, right? She was just, she was, she was preaching. She was, she was singing sometimes. She was just, I was like, yes, that is, that is awesome. And uh, so just seeing somebody who was in that space and freely being who they were. So she wasn't trying to be like him or anybody else. She brought her own personality, her own unique way of doing ministry to this whole thing. And I'm like, yeah, that's the way I want to, <laughs> that's what I want to do. And uh, so Reverend Kathy Patton, it was her name. And, um, and so she just it was, a, it was a, a role model for me in ministry. And uh, so that was that was important. Um, and then also when I um, did, uh, I was a church administrator in uh, Oakland uh, for a little while at the Allen Temple Baptist Church. And actually, that was the first time, uh, first place I met Frank Thomas many years ago. Okay. Um, but um, but uh, at, Al at the Allen Temple Baptist Church, um, there was a prophetic tradition that was a part of that congregation mm -hmm. that uh, influenced me in, in some ways. Um, because the pastor, uh, so even back in the, in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, uh, and there, were, there was film and stories about him going out into downtown Oakland uh, and, and working with Black Panthers in the Bay Area and just being very involved in what was happening in the lives of the people and how that still continued to shape the uh, place of that church in the community. People were expecting if there's something that was, you know, kind of popping off in the Oakland community uh, that wasn't right, that somebody from Allen Temple was gonna speak to it. Um, and they would bring in candidates for offices for a night of just talking about their different uh, views. Uh, so that prophetic and um, community kind of engagement was something that also in, in influenced uh, my ministry in, in some ways. So those were, were some of them. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. So I'm, gonna, uh, I'm thinking about, sometimes I've heard that 
those of us who teach preaching, uh -oh. the reason we teach <laughs> preaching is because we can't preach. <laughs> okay, all right. So I wonder how you address, oh, uh, I, I'm sure you've probably heard this too. Oh. And you know, mm -hmm. they, well, you know, they can't really do it, so they teach it. Wow. And, so at the core of that, it, it just seems like there's some, some, um, some how, can, how, to, how to put that? Uh, so disparagement or uh, of the worth of academic pursuit, right? Okay. So somehow trying to separate that which is uh, spiritual from that which is academic or scholarly. Like, okay, so if people study this thing and are maybe have a more academic or scholarly focus, then surely they can't not then actually embody it and, and actually lift the sermon off the page. And I wholly, you know, just like uh, say that is not true. Um, and so, uh, um, whereas there may be some people who um, just don't kind of pull all those components together, preaching in its truest form as praxis is both embodiment um, as well as a kind of a, um, an academic engagement as well. So, so it's like, so just because we study it and we look at it and we're able to teach other people uh, does not mean that we cannot then uh, bring all of those things uh, to fruition in, in our own preaching. And so there are too many people, too many examples of people who teach preaching, who are excellent preachers that, uh, for that to be true. So I totally reject that as an assumption. <laughs> and uh, so just like, you know, they, uh, in, in any profession, there are people who may teach who then can't do something. Uh, so there may be some exceptions, but I do not think that is the rule. So yes, I reject that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, mm -hmm. right. So even stepping from there, I'm thinking about how we, um, what we do here at CTS in our PhD program in African-American preaching and sacred rhetoric, yes. we are trying to help cultivate practitioner scholars even as some of us are scholar practitioners. Right. Um, I wanna say thank you. You've been a part of this program since even before I was part of the program and the consulting of the program and uh, working with Frank Thomas and continue to work with the program um, for which we are grateful. And so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your experience and, and the work that we're trying to do to help others in scholarship. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so one of the reasons I really like um, uh, teaching in this program is because of the tradition. So for so long, it seems like some people uh, wanted to relegate African-American preaching to just being an emotive experience. Yeah. So they're just up there yelling and screaming mm -hmm. and there's no rhyme you or reason exactly or rationale. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or rationale to anything that they're saying. Uh, and so from the time um, Henry Mitchell began to put down that tradition on paper mm -hmm. and uh, talking about the, con the need for connection between the mind uh, and the heart and that you have to have both and, 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 and dig into it, do some, some, some work in, in the text, bring some, some of that, um, some of the academic component. But if you don't appeal to the heart of the people uh, and don't give them something to celebrate, mm -hmm. Uh, then it's not going to stick. It's not going to stay with them. Um, and so, so part of that with this program, it, it brings the best of African-American preaching um, and uh, teaches people to carry on that tradition and to dig into that, you know, sacred rhetoric and the tradition of African-American preaching, bringing to the fore uh, in such a way that, um, uh, they honor the tradition in all of its complexity. And, and so I think that is, that is important. And it is something that everybody can learn from. In the Academy of Homiletics for you know, the past few years, we've been highlighting the gifts of African-American uh, preach, 
preaching traditions. And I do not believe there is um, a culture in the world that cannot benefit from learning something of our tradition. Um, and so by, by uh, helping more people go through the program, getting them out there in the world uh, to teach uh, based on that, I think uh, homiletics as a field is better off, the church is better off with, with, with more people with that knowledge. So I think it's important um, and, and it's the work I will continue to support in, in any way I can. What do you think is the future of preaching? Oh, the future of preaching. Oh yeah, just just a, a light. Just a light question as we wrap up. <laughs> uh, but so one of the things I know with the academy, um, uh, with the last academy, one of the things I was trying to explore was to bring people in who were doing preaching not just within the walls of the church. Um, but also outside of the church. So we had um, an African-American poet, Hannah Drake, come in and, and, and even in her poetry, that was preaching. Because at this core, preaching is a, a word from God to the people of God about the world of God, right? And so she was bringing that word in a way that had some rhythm, some syncopation. Um, but if we are able to look at what she was doing, for instance, as a poet, spoken word artist, I believe are profound preachers mm -hmm. because they speak to the situations and circumstances in people's lives. But then also they resist it, they critique uh, what's not being done. Uh, in, in, in our world in so many ways as well. And some of that is what we do in preaching, traditional spaces behind the pulpit, even though we have our particular methods, like you gotta start with the text, you gotta do all that. Um, so I think preach, the future of preaching is expanding in our minds what preaching can be. Uh, and it's not new we're talking about it newly because, for instance, African-American women have not been allowed traditionally behind the pulpit, but have been preaching for many years. Fannie Lou, Fannie Lou Hamer, Hamer, for instance, was a, was a preacher and never was licensed to preach, but oh, she preached. And so many people, Jarena Lee was never licensed to preach with the AME Church. Richard Allen, bless his heart, just couldn't see it in his heart to give her a license to preach, but she was a preacher none the less um, outside of the pulpit. Yeah. And so there are a lot of people who have been outside of the pulpit, outside of the tradition, uh, but we need to uh, kind, of, kind of expand in our minds what preaching can be, uh, the spaces where it can happen. And uh, when we do that, I think we can help our world continue to become a, a, a better world. Yeah. Right. So just free our minds a little bit about what preaching, that, uh, the possibilities of preaching. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mumford, this has been my pleasure to just talk with you today about your preaching journey, your life as a minister and administrator, I should add. And so I want to say thank you for Absolutely. just sharing with us today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. This has been just a wonderfully rich conversation. Again, I'm Dr. Courtney Bugs, and here at Christian Theological Seminary, thank you for joining us for another installation of the Legacy Series. We hope you'll join us again as we continue in uh, promoting African-American preaching and sacred rhetoric and all preaching that liberates. Thank you. <laughs>